who tells your story. So the musical Hamilton is the telling of the story of his life. And when we last left him, Eliza and Hamilton were grieving over the loss of their son. The story doesn't end there though, right? It continues on in Hamilton's life and Eliza's life continues on. And Hamilton continues in politics. But in that adventure, he makes an enemy. In the musical, Hamilton dies because he doesn't um, accept that Burr should be president. He wants someone who has firm opinions and you know what they stand for. In real life, that wasn't the point at which the duel happened between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. In real life, it happened when, Al, um, when Aaron Burr was running for governor and Hamilton again is against him, doesn't want him to become the governor. And so that's when, the, when Aaron Burr decides to challenge Hamilton to a duel. <clears throat> and in that duel, Hamilton dies. And then Aaron Burr sings this song. He sings, death doesn't discriminate. Between the sinners and the saints, it takes and it takes and it takes. History obliterates. In every picture it paints, it paints me and all my mistakes. When Alexander aimed at the sky, he may have been the first one to die, but I'm the one who paid for it. Who tells your story? So how many last words of David are there? You're assuming that the ones I read today are the last words of David. He has nine more sets of last words after this set of last words. Why did David have so many last words? Why did they have to tell his story over and over again? What was it about David's story that was the story that needed to be retold by the people of Israel? So the last words we had today occur at the end of this story we were telling, right? We were moving through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. And so these are at the end of 2 Samuel. And so we have his last words. Words that talk about what would be, what would good rulership look like? What makes for a good king, a good ruler? And it's a king that brings light to the world, right? It's a king that brings justice. And then it ends in a way that I'm like, oh, you had to go there, didn't you? It ends on the note of, and you need to destroy my enemies after I'm gone. Then the book of 2 Samuel ends. And in the next books, in 1 Kings, David again dies. And they tell his last words again. In these set of last words, David is giving Solomon advice. What should he be like? What should he do? How should he be a ruler? And of course, Take care of my enemies. Make sure you take care of my enemies. But those aren't the last words. Because then we get to the chronicler. And the, so in First and Second Samuel and in the story of Kings, those stories were written before Israel went into exile. Those stories were written at a time when they were seeing exile coming and knowing that they were in trouble, and so they wanted powerful kings who could help to save them. Well, years later, hundreds of years later, when the writers of the Bible looked back at the story of David, they looked at it from a different perspective. They looked at it as a perspective of people who have been in exile and are now trying to rebuild their kingdom, are trying to rebuild what it looks like to live together. 
And so the chronicler comes along and rewrites the story of David. He takes out all the bad stuff, okay? So the chronicler is trying to give people hope. They have been in a world that has been controlled by other people, and the chronicler comes along and wants to tell a story that will help them move forward, that will help them see the world in a new light, will help them to experience a new way of being, help them to reform themselves as people. And so in the Chronicles, when they tell of the death of David, when they tell the story of David's life, they take all that they know about David from 1st and 2nd Samuel, and they take the image of David that has started to appear in the prophets, in Isaiah and Jeremiah, where they talk about David as the ideal king, the Messiah, that the ancestors of David, that his ancestors will bring forth a new king, a king that will transform the world. And so the chronicler looks at David's story and says, well, then we need to clean this thing up. We can't have that story of Bathsheba in there, or the story of his daughter Tamar, or any of those really unpleasant things that the kids did to each other. We're going to make it a nice story. A story that tells of a king who was and is to be. A story that makes the king into an image that we can aspire to. <clears throat> and so they tell the story of David again. A heroic David. A David who, when they get to the last words are again last words to his son Solomon. But they're also last words to the people. They're last words about the building of the temple. And he starts talking about how he was not able to build the temple. Like Moses, he got you there to the promised land, but he couldn't go the final step. And with the house for God, with a temple, a lasting memorial to God, David was able to get you to the door, but he couldn't build the door. So the last words are about all the things he gathered together, all the offerings he gathered together, so that Solomon would have what he needed to build the temple for God. And it speaks about God. It speaks about the Lord who is with them always. And it asks, it asks Solomon to be courageous and brave. And to bless God and to remember God and to remember the God of their ancestors. The last words. Isn't it interesting how last words can change based upon what you need them to say. So when my father got dementia, he would tell this story. And my sisters and brother and mom were, I don't know why he keeps telling this story, because they had never asked him when he was still coherent. But he would tell the story of being in high school and how my dad, now you should know my dad is a big guy. He's like, he was 6'2 and built like a football player, okay? So in my life, I always had this image of a big, huge man, right? And so as a teenager, he still was, he was the, the center in the um, defense for football. So he was that, you know, protected the quarterback. So he tells the story of being in high school and my uncle said, I don't know where this story happened. Where was I? I was always with him. But the story my dad tells is of wanting to protect those who were being picked on by the other kids. And so my dad, 6'2", giant, was taking care of the younger kids or the smaller kids. 
And he tells about one time being in a fight with someone who was so, that he was so angry with him, that they were fighting so hard that it, my, my dad thought, oh my God, I could kill him. Now, the story my dad told to my brothers and sisters were, you need to fight back and protect those who need you. But they had never asked my dad about his call story. Like, why did he become a pastor, right? But when I was considering becoming a pastor, I decided to take a class that had me have to interview people about their call story. So, of course, since my dad's a pastor, I'm like, well, I gotta find out his story. And so he told me that story of feeling so angry that he could have hurt someone so badly that it changed something inside him. It changed how he looked at the world. And from that moment on, when he got anger, he didn't let the anger control him. He went for a lot of walks, because you know how teenagers are and how much we can make our parents angry. My dad went for a lot of walks when we were teenagers. But he told that story, but they didn't know the punchline, right? They didn't know that the story was told because for him, it changed who he was. It was the beginning of the journey to becoming a pastor. Because all of my aunts and uncles and his cousins, and he has a million cousins, because he's one of seven, the middle of seven. And my grandmother had 10, 11 brothers and sisters. So lots of family. He was seen as the... I don't know, big jokester who sort of picked on his little sisters and older sisters, right? But because he was so big, they didn't see him as the smart one in the family because during that time in the 1950s, they didn't diagnose you with dyslexia. He didn't learn he had dyslexia until he was actually in seminary. So his second degree. And so they didn't see him as someone who could be a pastor. But slowly and surely, my dad's story changed in those years. But the story he told at the end of life was about protecting other people because it was so important to him that it had changed who he was. How we tell our stories, who we tell our stories to, and how they're told changes how people see us. That's why that last song goes through how Eliza tries to change the story of Hamilton, right? Because the story of Hamilton that you mostly learned in your textbooks in history class was he authored the papers, the Federalist papers, and that he was in a duel when Aaron Burr and died, right? but you didn't learn about the full picture of who he was. And so the story of Eliza at the end in that song is what she does to change the memory of Hamilton, about how she works for those things that were important to him, that she gathers the stories of soldiers who fought with him, that she helps to raise money to build a monument to George Washington. that she fights against slavery. And then she says, or they say in the song, and the most important thing she did was to establish the orphanage. But it wasn't just an orphanage, it was also a school that taught kids in the neighborhood where she lived. Because after Hamilton died, they did not have a lot of money and people supported them for a while to keep the house that Hamilton had bought, but she couldn't afford the bills with all the children. 
And so she had to move into a smaller place in a worse neighborhood. And she realized that the kids around her that had less friends to rely on didn't have that ability to get an education. And so she wanted a school that would give them an education, and she wanted a place for people like Hamilton, who lost their parents, a place where they would be safe, and now all, not left out on the streets all alone to fend for themselves. Now here's the thing. His legacy, her legacy, of that orphanage and school is still alive today that that orphanage transformed into a social service organization that still helps the same people in New York City. Who tells your story? How do you want it told? What stories are so important to you that you need to share them with your kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, that they know what is important there's a story, a famous Jewish parable, that is about a man who planted a carob tree. And he's interrupted by an onlooker who asks, why are you planting a carob tree? It takes 70 years to grow. You're never going to enjoy it. The man responds, I have great memories eating dried carob as a child on two bashavit. Those carob trees were planted by people who wanted to leave a gift for the generations to come. I'm planting this tree as a gift for the generations who will be living 70 years from now. Then they can enjoy eating carob on two Bashabbat too. Just as my parents and grandparents planted trees for me, so I plant trees for my children and grandchildren. Miranda has a similar line in one of the songs. What is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. While most of us will never have a Broadway hit written about our lives, we still have stories to share. Stories that tell of the things that are important to us, that share the memory of who we hope to be, who we want to be. So, my ancestor's story. A story that I have lots of problems with now that we know American history differently. But the story my ancestors tell of who we are, of who we should be, is that we are a people who believe that religion was something that everyone should be available to practice. And so they fled from England to the Netherlands and fled from the Netherlands to the United States. And when they got to the United States and the Puritans told them that they couldn't practice their faith, they moved to Rhode Island and Connecticut. Now, my ancestors leave out the whole stealing land from the Native Americans part of it. But that story, that story of being a people who wanted a place where you could practice your faith, where you could practice your faith in a way that didn't harm your neighbors, is the story that has been passed down through the generations to my generation. How will you tell the story of your people? How will you share your life with the generations to come so that your legacy your legacy can be like how they describe David. It says that David is like that grass, that grass that grows after the rain. Like our hills, right? In the spring, they turn green because the rains have come. Right now, they're very brown, but when those rains start coming, they become green. That's our legacy. To tell that story that shines the light that is like the rain that brings the new grass. Amen.